Story, Enter Apocalypse Neary, Africa. Callas, disguised as an international journalist, drove into the Goma refugee camp at 10.30. He parked in the designated area, afterwards he hopped out the Land Rover Jeep like a springy 20-year-old. It belied that he was 60. He wiped the perspiration caused by the morning heat from his face with a handkerchief, meanwhile he gave the camp a good look around. The shabby and overcrowded mostly women and noisy children camp reminded him of the others he had seen all over the world in his long career. A soldier approached him. Callus flashed his media badge at the young man. I want to speak with Alex Soberk, said the spymaster in a fake British accent. The soldier checked the media badge and gave Callus a look over. This way. The soldier nodded towards a brown tent that was a short distance from where the two stood. Eventually they arrived at the front of the tent, and the soldier poked his head inside, identification of the visitor followed. Shortly thereafter, Dr. Alex Soberk emerged from the tent. He was mid-thirties, lanky, with a fair amount of muscle on his bones, the brown eyes were sharp and moreover he resembled his father the dictator of Aranzi. Something that made Soberk bitter whenever he looked in the mirror, because he didn't like his father. I have already given enough interviews for the week, said Soberk in a voice tempered by Western education. This is a different type of interview. It involves Africa and your latent magic, said Callus. Soberk's use of his abilities to help the sick had made him world famous, nevertheless the manner in which Callus had spoken made him suspicious. Who are you really? The man that is going help you do more for this continent and the wider world. Soberk glanced at the soldier, and the officer melted away from the tent. Then Callus and Soberk entered the tent. Callus's scheme was simple. Soberk's powers were to be boosted to great magnitudes and he was to replace his father as ruler of Aranzi. Then the nation would offer its assistance to world. But the people Callus worked for would influence the country. All the while tighter isolation strategies would be placed on Wakanda making it more difficult for other nations to receive help from them. Still Soberk was no fool. He had followed Wakanda's recent push for the mutant policy in the UN and its subsequent approval. Several countries didn't like Wakanda's success, which went against their own interests. The approval showed that Wakanda had political influence, which had to be either curtailed or contained. Therefore Soberk knew he was being used as a pawn against Wakanda. But he had no intention of remaining one. However, Callus was operating on limited time, because the Black Panther and Storm were hunting him due to the Berlin incident. But by the time they find me, it will be already too late, he thought as he made the deal with Soberk. Chapter stop or I'll crush him, shouted Muller Bairn. Ororo floated down on air currents in front of the mercenary and his hostage. Muller's bio-external armor gleamed. He held the slim man comfortably in his hands. He breathed heavily because of the chase through Bing Aram Island. Ororo stared at the determined mercenary. She knew he meant the words. Still, thought Ororo. Then she was sharply raising her left hand and firing a lightning bolt into the terrified hostage. However it did not kill him. The man merely became limp and passed out. Amused, Muller looked at the wilted hostage and he released his hold slightly. It gave Ororo the opening to fire a stronger lightning bolt than the one before into Muller's exposed chest. The impact forced Muller through the wall he stood in front of while the hostage slipped out his grasps. The mercenary landed awkwardly, yet he scrambled onto his feet and ran towards the coastline. He wondered what happened to his twin brother who he had last seen being chased by T'Challa. A sudden bang came from the left of him. Instinctively he knew it was his brother and T'Challa fighting. I have to help him, said Muller. However a gust lifted him off his feet and he was carried some distance. Eventually he began falling. 
he splashed into a grey sandy substance. Instantly he realised that his body was sinking. No, no, no. Muller was yelling into the night air, and he was thrashing about as though he was drowning. Ororo had placed in him the quicksand. She hovered over Muller with her arms crossed. He looked up at her desperately. Depower yourself and tell me who you work for, commanded Ororo. Subsequently Muller mentally deactivated the bio-armor. I don't know who it is, he shouted as the quicksand reached his neck. A name, demanded Ororo. Xen. That's all I know. I swear. The quicksand covered his mouth. Soon only the black short hair remained above the surface. Still hovering, Ororo slipped her right first finger into the quicksand. The substance churned and then it spat out Muller. Ororo took the syringe from her belt. She caught Muller with air currents, afterwards she shocked him with volts of electricity from her fingertips. He became more manageable. Hence she stuck the syringe into his neck while both of them were still airborne. The nanites from the syringe flooded Muller's bloodstream and they subdued the biochemicals that gave him his extraordinary ability. Ororo elevated further until she spotted T'Challa and the next brother. T'Challa had stabbed through the man's bio-armor with the sword. Subsequently the glowing armor disappeared. Then the man lay on the root of a palm tree while T'Challa interrogated him. She turned her focus to the hotel the brothers were staying at. Shuri was there. Then Ororo concentrated on the energy emitted by the invisible jet that hovered over the hotel, since Umba was inside of it. Satisfied, Ororo headed for T'Challa. Chapter T'Challa placed the second bairn to sleep when he struck two nerves on the man's body. Ororo gracefully landed next to T'Challa while she dropped Muller unceremoniously near to his brother. He said a woman named Exxon also works for their mystery contractor. That she may know who he is. She's operating out of the Goba Desert in Mongolia, said T'Challa while he pulled back the Black Panther mask. This one also mentioned Exxon, said Ororo as went up close him. Then T'Challa kissed her full-blooded on the lips. She responded likewise. Eventually and reluctantly their lips separated. T'Challa stared into the blue pools of her eyes. They reminded him of tropical getaways to spend quality time together. What do you say? After all this is over that you and I come back and check out the nearby islands, said T'Challa. Don't forget that our next vacation will have to be off-planet. She hooked her right arm into his left and she planted her chin on his firm shoulder. A smile came on her face as a sensation surged through her body she wanted him, but it was neither the time nor place for it. She could sense that he wanted her also. All right. He kissed her on the neck. Subsequently Aurora looked down on the prisoners. We'll drop them off home then head for the Gobi. Okay. But I wonder if Shuri found anything else. T'Challa detached the Kamoyo from his belt and he dialed his sister. She answered and the conversation was brief. Then he hung up. She found fake passports, billfolds of different currencies including Mongolian, and cell phones. But all the numbers and messages were erased from the phones. The Secret Service might dig up something from the ghost memory on the phones, said Ororo. I'll take these two to the plane while you get Shuri. Then the couple kissed. Afterwards Ororo floated up into sky with the prisoners, and then she headed for the jet. Meanwhile T'Challa used the sword's time-space computers to teleport onto the balcony of the room Muller was staying in. He found Shuri rummaging through the man's belongings. She wore the white vibranium weave body armor. The sonic wave cannon slung over her right shoulder. Shuri sensed her brother's presence thus she turned to him. We got some information, said T'Challa. So who are we going after? She dropped the traveling bag. Someone else who also did work for the contractor. 
in Mongolia. Okay. She sounded driven. But we'll drop off the Bayern's home first. We'll need the cell phones. One minute later, the two teleported into the jet. Umba was still at the controls where he monitored the Indian Coast Guard, and he jammed any signals from the island. Aurora was placing manacles on the Bairns. They were on the left corner of the jet's main area. Then Aurora turned towards Shuri. Could you pilot the jet to Wakanda? Tichala and I have to speak privately in the back. No problem, said Shuri. She pulled back her mask and it revealed her medium hair cut, chestnut eyes, and long face. Then the angular young woman sat in the pilot of seat next to Umba. Meanwhile Aurora and Tichala went to the middle of the jet. Aurora closed the door. What do you want to speak about, inquired Tichala. Aurora smiled slyly. This. Then she slipped her arms around his neck and brought his head down to hers. Afterwards they began kissing. She found it was necessary in order to keep the romantic spark alive in their relationship, despite the hectic lifestyle. Tichala responded by holding her around the waist and bringing her closer to him. Chapter Concurrently Shuri wondered what she could discuss with Umba. They had traveled to Hong Kong then to India and finally Bing Aram Island without a word between each other. She looked over at the blind stocky 15-year-old. A vertical red light continuously ran across his computerized visor's lens. Do you miss the world outside of Wakanda? She finally asked. Umba turned to the direction the voice came. Sometimes. But I find Wakanda to be better in some ways. Shuri searched through her knowledge of the teenager for something else to talk about. She knew he was a former child soldier and his father was a warlord. What about your mother? Tichala told me that she died. But do you have any memory of her? inquired Shuri. No I don't even know what caused her death. What are your plans when you get older? I would like to tour the rest of Africa. Help former child soldiers like myself and other kids that got caught up in the wars. It sounded like a means of redemption to Shuri, because from what she understood Umba and his father were involved in most of those wars for the wrong reasons. Can I ask you a question, inquired Umba. Go ahead. Do you have a problem with Tichala teaching me the Black Panther combat techniques? She thought about it for a moment. Not really. Tichala believes you are worthy of it. Umba had a relieved expression then he turned away from her. He liked Shuri now. Ten minutes later, Tichala and Aurora returned to main area. The couple sat in the passenger seats while they held the other's hand. Shuri glanced at them, afterwards, she resumed flying the jet back to Wakanda. Chapter The jet landed on top the Secret Service building. Several officers were on site to handle the Bairns. The head of the Secret Service approached Tichala and Aurora. I have a development, he said. There is a new virus. It was discovered six hours ago in Carollo. The authorities there say they have it contained. But there are reports it may be spreading outside of the country. Immediately Tichala and Aurora contacted Wakanda's Foreign Affairs Division. They wanted a message sent to the Carolos Prime Minister requesting a meeting to discuss Wakanda's assistance in dealing with the virus. Meanwhile Shuri handed over the items taken from the Bayerns to the Secret Service personnel. Afterwards the four warriors returned to the jet and they headed for the Goba Desert. Chapter N. Sabaner aka Apocalypse studied the media reports from the television satellite feeds. The reports featured stories on Carollo's mysterious virus. He smiled. It has begun, he said. Then mentally he ordered the satellite feeds to shut down. The top tier of Nokia Exxon's laboratory became quiet. He approached the banister and then peered down at the lower levels. Nokia was there as usual working silently. 
Two android helpers were at her side. Her beauty reminded him of an Egyptian princess he once knew and loved, but inevitably she rejected him because his mutant features. That was the moment he turned his back on humanity. Nokia sensed he was watching her, hence she looked up at him. It was a stare totally devoid of emotion. Her face was round, the hair in a ponytail and the eyes black. She was in her late forties. Abruptly Nokia looked away and resumed her work of recreating his original body. But he kept gazing at her. He was reading her mind. All her focus was on mastering the genetic map and biochemical mechanics that were before her. It was her gift to read the genetic material of others. While other geneticists took years to work out and understand the mysteries she did it in mere minutes or a few hours based on the complexity of the matter. Tired of observing the doctor, Apocalypse walked over to the war table. His heavy steps were like a giant's. He looked like one too. Apocalypse stood at 15 feet tall. He weighed a ton due to the blue techno armor that held his essence and consciousness. It was the lack of a proper body that made him seek out Exxon. The body he was born with had burned out over the millenniums because of his immense powers. Hence he used half of his concentration to hold his current form, but his great plan required him at full power thus he needed a body of flesh and bone. The plan itself was an incarnation of others he had perpetrated from ancient Egypt to pre-Columbus South America. Hence the name had given himself Apocalypse. The impetuous for committing such despicable acts was his fixation on the concept of survival of the fittest. It was beaten into him as a child in the nomad tribe that he had traveled with between Egypt and present-day Jordan. By the time he became a teenager he was one of the best warriors in the tribe. He surveyed the war table. There were coded estimations of the regions that would be most affected by the pandemic. Those devastated locations would be bases for his reign. Chapter Apocalypse realized that four intruders were outside of the laboratory. He mentally locked onto the external surveillance system, which allowed him to observe the intruders. He recognized one immediately. Storm he said and a thin smile came on his face as he remembered easily defeating her. They had met on several occasions in his confrontations with the X-Men. Then he noticed T'Challa. Finally I meet a legendary Wakandan, Apocalypse said. As the pharaoh of Egypt his spies had informed him of the isolated nation rumored to be unconquerable. But he never had the opportunity to put that boast to the test. Now I do he said. He estimated that Wakanda's isolation would likely make them the last strongholds of human resistance to his reign. Therefore he would have to crush them. Shuri was a stranger to him, but when he viewed Umba's face, he saw a few physical traits that resembled Exxon's. Physical traits that were passed from mother to child. Her son, said Apocalypse intrigued. He secretly knew about Exxon's brief relationship with Shaitani the warlord and that she gave their baby to him because she didn't want to raise the child. He left the table and walked briskly to the banister. Then he flew off of top tier and descended. He landed loudly on the lower level. A disturbed Exxon raised her head and glared at him. We have unwanted guests, said Apocalypse before she could utter a word. Who? she said as her red eyes gleamed more intensely. The mutant storm and the Black Panther. His voice boomed and his enunciation was like a Shakespearean stage actor. How soon before you are finished? She glanced at the 15-foot tall and cylinder-shaped chamber that housed the original body. A few minutes afterwards you can transfer your essence and consciousness into the body, she replied. Then deal with these people while I wait. He didn't warn her about Umba likewise the virus, because she had to find out for herself. Exxon switched her focus to the first android. Display surveillance. The robot emitted a hologram from its eyes that showed the intruders. Promptly Exxon left her workstation.
she armed herself with a high-powered rifle and then she called the head of Mongolian National Security with a wireless phone. The person answered sleepily. Good morning. I have a problem. There are trespassers on my property. I want someone down here immediately, because that is what I'm paying you for. She marched towards the front of the laboratory. The multiple doors closed behind her. Who are these people? Exxon asked herself. She didn't take kindly to threats to her operation, she had built it from scratch. She was born in West Africa to doctors. Her gift was discovered early on and she specialized in genetics. However her colleagues at prominent Western universities were openly jealous of her achievements, and then laws existed that debarred the experiments she wanted. Hence she started working for the underworld where large sums were paid for the genetic manipulation services she provided. Moreover she was free to experiment. Eventually secret service agencies for different nations gave her work that they didn't want their governments to know about. Soon Exxon reached the front blast door and she opened it. Tichala, Ororo, Shuri and Umba were standing a few feet away in the cold Mongolian night. Chapter Exxon's eyes reddened as she scanned the trespassers on a molecular level. She paused when she reached Umba, because he had Shaitanese genes as well as hers. You there with the visor, said Exxon. What's your name? For a second, Umba was unsure whether to either answer or not. Thus he settled for his code name. Deadai, he replied. Where is Shaitani? asked Exxon. Umba was puzzled. Dead, he replied. Tichala interjected. You're Nokia Exxon. She stared at him bluntly. Yes. And you're trespassing. We're looking for someone you worked for. He's the one who sent the Bayerns to you, said Ororo. Exxon noted the woman's long white hair, blue eyes, lean build, and ex gene. I have nothing to say to you. For your sakes I suggest you remove yourselves. Tichala hyperhearing picked up on the approaching military jeeps. He heard as the vehicles bumped on the rocky desert terrain. The front lights cut through the darkness. Eventually the twelve jeeps settled a short distance from the group. The soldiers aimed their weapons at the strangers. There was a chorus of safety catches being switched off and weapons cocking. As you can see, said Exxon. I have a permit from the government to work here. Therefore any interference will mean your immediate arrest. Then she activated the closure of the blast door. All the while she kept her eye on Umba, her son. Eventually the door slid across fully. Then she held her forehead in disbelief. God it's him, she muttered. Afterwards she journeyed back to the central lab. She remembered Shaitani, the way he had charmed her and the feeling that she might have loved him as he did her. But her ambitions were too great at that time and she believed that he slowed her down. Even more so that the child would do the same thing. Therefore she separated herself from them. Exxon walked into the lab and she saw the techno armor husk on the floor. Meanwhile the chamber hummed. Then its door opened. Chapter Apocalypse strode out the chamber victoriously. The hair was black and shoulder length. His eyes were bright blues. The skin was grayish. He mentally summoned the techno armor. It rose, disassembled, the parts floated around him and then they reassembled. He concentrated for less than a second, then his right hand transformed into a laser cannon. He aimed it towards his scalp and fired it. Moments afterwards he had shaved off all the hair from the skull. Afterwards the laser cannon reverted into the normal hand. Exxon was impressed with her work, hence she stopped thinking about her son. But Apocalypse was interested in her reaction. Did you see your son? he asked. Exxon snapped out of giving herself self-praise. How are you aware of that? There's so much that I know about you. 
then he searched her mind with telepathy. He encountered the fresh memories from her scan of Umba. Moreover Exxon's examination revealed Umba's eyes had a peculiar and deadly ability, but he was not born with it. Apocalypse became aware of a sandstorm outside the laboratory. Subsequently the inner doors were ripped to shreds by energy blasts. Storm and the others are inside, he said. Chapter Tichala followed Exxon's scent to the central lab. Meanwhile Aurora tore down the doors with the lightning bolts from her hands like a goddess. Shuri and Umba ran behind the couple. Subsequently the group came upon Apocalypse and Exxon. Him, said an astonished Aurora and she fired at one of her most fearsome enemies. Tichala drew his sword and he sprinted towards Apocalypse. The towering mutant converted his right arm into a shield, which blocked the lightning attack. Meanwhile his left hand became elongated and it shot into Tichala. However the Black Panther leapt out the hand's path, he landed and rolled twice until he stopped. He rose slowly with his focus on the Great Mutant as he devised several means of attack. Concurrently Exxon ordered her androids to attack. Then she activated the self-destruction of her computer files. Twin submachine guns formed out of the shoulders of the androids, which stood side by side. The robots targeted Shuri, however, the agile woman somersaulted three times to her right, eventually she escaped their line of fire. Then she brought the sonic wave cannon into her hands. The robots took a moment to realign their attack. A moment was all Shuri required. She selected the mid-range level option on the slender cannon. Then she fired at the first android. The sound wave shattered the machine into pieces. Shuri swiftly switched to the second android and fired. Instantly the target scattered into the air. Meanwhile Exxon's rifle sights were on Umba. Apocalypse saw her and he sensed her intentions. No. He yelled and teleported Dumba, Exxon, and himself out of the laboratory. Chapter A strong wind blew on the Quinzan mountain cliff and then Apocalypse and the humans appeared. He quickly snatched the rifle from Exxon. Umba stayed planted in his ground, but he was not afraid just prepared for an attack. What are you doing? demanded Exxon. I require the boy's abilities, replied Apocalypse. He pointed to a parked jeep. Is that not you emergency getaway vehicle? Use it. Exxon turned her eyes from him and she watched her son. What's your real name? Umba. What's it you? Nothing, she muttered lowly. Then Exxon ran towards the jeep and got into it. Subsequently she started the ignition. But she peered back at Umba. Apocalypse sensed the war within her. She wanted to reveal the truth to Umba, yet she wanted no connection with him. Eventually Exxon turned away and she drove off. I asked you a question, shouted Umba. But Exxon ignored it as she drove further and left a dust tail in her wake. She was your mother, said Apocalypse. He peered at Umba. Here we have the offspring of two very vicious people. Surly that trait has been passed on to him and I will exploit it, he thought. My mother is dead, said Umba vehemently. For a moment, Apocalypse remembered he was also abandoned. The nomads had found him crying on the desert. Believe what you will, but she's very much alive. Now you'll open your mind to me. Suddenly Umba sensed Apocalypse telepathy. The Psi Shields will stop him, thought Umba gratefully. Son. I have battled head to head with Celestials. Surely something as trifle as Psi Shields cannot hinder me, said Apocalypse. Then his telepathy pierced Umba's mind. Consequently he gained control of the teenager. In time too, because Apocalypse was sensing Umba's family approaching. They glided on the horizon due to air currents controlled by Aurora. She was flanked by Tichala and Shuri. Thus Apocalypse had Umba face the direction his loved ones were coming from. 
once they are in range. Destroy them, Apocalypse commanded while he folded his arms confidently. Chapter Tichala spotted Umba and Apocalypse with his hypervision. Ororo and Shuri were unable to, because of the vast distance. That's odd, said Tichala, Umba is just standing there. He might be comprised, said Shuri. Tichala glanced over Ororo's right shoulder at his sister. Her hands were by her sides while her legs were close together. She watched back at him. She may be right, said Ororo even though it hurt her to say those words. Her legs were close to together while the arms were extended forward. Then we'll take him out, said Tichala sadly. He returned to Umba and Apocalypse. He judged Umba's distance and related to Ororo like sniper's spotter. Subsequently Ororo concentrated, and her eyes produced a white gleam. The wind picked up on the cliff. Gradually Apocalypse unfolded his arms. What is Storm doing? he asked. Before he knew it, a lightning bolt streaked across the sky and it touched Umba with pinpoint accuracy. He dropped immediately. Yet Apocalypse sensed he was alive and knocked out. Moreover Umba had no burns on his body. Apocalypse grinned. She is still decisive. A shame that her mind can fight me off, so I have no need for her. Soon after, he elevated from the cliff, he flew forward. However his body began expanding. In a matter of seconds, Apocalypse stood as tall as Quinzan Mountain. He extended his mighty arms forward with opened palms. They were aimed at his attackers. You enter into your own destruction, he said in the booming voice that went out for a mile. Then he fired an all-consuming energy blast from both hands. Chapter The Great Energy Blast was as wide as the eye can see. Thus Tichala reacted quickly, he shouted to the sword. Nanoseconds later, the group teleport just as the energy wave washed over their location. They reappeared in the air behind Apocalypse. Tichala already had a tactic planned for the Goliath. Honey, Shuri, and I will impair him. Then you'll drop him, he said. Got it, said Ororo. Apocalypse sharply turned his head clockwise and he spotted the three. Like insects, he said. Subsequently his entire body turned around. Ororo started the plan. She fired raking plasma energy blasts from her opened palms towards Apocalypse's face. As a result, he blocked the assault with his colossal hands. Futile attempts, he chided. In that brief instant, Tichala and Shuri had teleported onto the tip of Apocalypse's head. The Black Panther struck his claws into the giant's forehead, and then he quickly slid down the slope. The glove's claws decreasing his rate of descent. He halted by the right eye, then he stabbed the sword into the blue iris. Without hesitation, he leapt to the left eye and inflicted the same wound. Meanwhile Shuri had fearlessly slid down to the right ear and she mimicked Tichala's use his claws with her laser knife. Subsequently she turned the sonic cannon to maximum. Then she fired into the ear. Apocalypse yelled in both pain and anger. He reared back his head. Still Tichala and Shuri held on firmly. Tichala teleported to the tip once more. He quickly headed for Shuri. He found her and they teleport back to Ororo. Apocalypse held his face as he was blinded. That provided an opportunity for Ororo, which she took. She extended her hands and ignited all the hydrogen particles around Apocalypse. There was a brief pause and then a flash. Tichala and Shuri covered their eyes. The hydrogen explosion rocked Apocalypse. He fell backwards as though the hand of God struck him. I'll get Umba, said Shuri. Therefore Ororo glided her down on the air currents. Then Tichala and Ororo went after Apocalypse in the valley, because they knew he would heal soon. Chapter Apocalypse rapidly shrunk back to his original size. 
all the while his right inner healed. But eyes were taking longer than he was accustomed to. What is the reason for this? He wondered. Despite his blindness, the mighty mutant managed to stand on the desert ground. Tichala saw him as he did that. I have him in my sights, said Tichala while Ororo and him rode the winds downwards. Then do it now, said Ororo. Therefore the Black Panther told his sword the CO ordinates. Thereafter he disappeared from Ororo's side. He traveled through folded time and space. Then he reappeared directly above Apocalypse. The sword's computers had allocated for the gravitational pull, as a result, T'Challa was not hampered by it. He extended his left arm with an opened palm, the hand rested on Apocalypse's left shoulder blade while the rest of T'Challa's body stayed vertical and perfectly straight like a gymnast. Then with the utmost precision T'Challa guided his sword over Apocalypse's head towards the chest, and then he plunged the dark force energy blade into the evil being's heart. Eh ah ah. Apocalypse knew his body about to die. He could sense that the sword pierced his very essence. Nonetheless he concentrated vigorously. Soon his consciousness and essence slipped out the armor. T'Challa skillfully somersaulted off the body. Simultaneously the soulless body fell face forward. It sounded like if a marble statue had fallen onto the red earth. Then T'Challa quickly decapitated it. Chapter A Strong Gust Blew Around T'Challa He believed it was Aurora but it was Apocalypse's doing. Dust shrouded T'Challa's vision, then it died down. In the aftermath, Apocalypse's armor was gone and the corpse remained. With his strength diminishing, Apocalypse teleported to his hibernation chamber in Peru. He estimated that a considerable number of years might pass before he healed completely. Nevertheless his virus would have worked its damage. However in the Gobi Desert, T'Challa and Ororo viewed the carcass. Do you think he's done away with? You never know with Apocalypse, replied Ororo. But do you think he was responsible for kidnapping Ramonda? I'm not sure. We'll see what we can gather from Exxon's base. His kamoyo rang, Shuri's face appeared on the screen. What's happening? she inquired. Looks like he's dead. How's Umba? Still unconscious, but he's physically okay. We'll head back to Exxon's base and check it out. Another call was coming through, so Aurora took it on her kamoyo. She read the message from Wakanda's secret service. The base was blown up. Five minutes ago, said Aurora disappointed. And Exxon has disappeared for now. By the way, did either of you notice Umba's resemblance to her?" asked Shuri. Kind of, replied Ororo. Probably coincidental, answered T'Challa. Subsequently the group returned to Wakanda with the corpse. Chapter The Secret Service made a breakthrough when they recovered the Bayern's cell phone's deleted memories. A code was discovered. And T'Challa recognized it. It was used by the forerunner of S.H.I.E.L.D., he said in the Situation Room. That should rule out Apocalypse for now, since we're dealing with espionage in this circumstance. Nick Fury might know something, stated Aurora and she turned to head of the Secret Service. Where is Fury now? The man quickly made a call to a department. Moments later he provided the location. Thus T'Challa and Aurora teleport there. They had planned to return and deal with the strange virus that was gradually creeping around the world. Meanwhile Shuri had deemed it appropriate for her visit Umba in the medical ward. He hadn't awakened as yet when she sat next to the bed. Suddenly his eyelids twitched and he awoke. He looked at Shuri. Where's T'Challa? They went to check someone concerning the search. How do you feel? Not so good. I'll get the doctor. No, wait. My body is all right. Then what's wrong? He stared at her. Exxon is my mother. 
story, Disarmament New York Times Tuesday, September 12 Russia's President Slams Superhuman Disarmament Group Global One Yesterday Russia's President, Boris Dmitry, denounced any attempts to disarm his nation's arsenal of superhuman soldiers. In his speech to a military inspection parade, the President noted that the country had already conceded to nuclear disarmament with the West. Afterwards he directly labeled the superhuman disarmament group Global One, as unwanted nuances. Global One, which comprises of former world leaders, generals, and several heads of states, has been clamoring for talks on the disarmament issue. When reached for a response to Russia's president's statements, the founder and head of Global One, Premier Augustus of Dayton, stated that it was unfortunate that leaders are blind to the arms race created by militarist superhumans. Prompted to divulge what the group's next step would be the Premier said, we are exploring our options. Chapter Malice was discovered to be gravely ill. The news was like a gunshot and the conspirators were left shell-shocked and still. Eventually Premier Augustus gathered his wits. At the time he was speaking with the prison warden. I'll contact the CML, they'll take her back. The words were both calm and authoritative. Three minutes later, Augustus was on the phone with Dr. Bullum, the chief geneticist at the Central Medical Laboratory. The Premier asked eager questions on the possible reasons for Malice's ailment but no clear answers were forthcoming from Bullum. Within minutes of the conversation, Malice was airlifted from the maximum security prison where she was a guest prisoner and taken five miles away. The Central Medical Laboratory was a sprawling complex bordered by sentinel fern trees. Songbirds usually disturbed the otherwise cemetery atmosphere. It was mid-evening when the medical helicopter landed on the roof of the main building. A battery of armed guards and four doctors including Dr. Bullum flocked to the aircraft as its rotor blades died down. No one except Dr. Bullum knew the real reason Malice was being kept at the facility and had only been released for the impending visit from Tichala and Ororo, Wakanda's heads of state. Bullum had a bullet head, grey eyes, and a clean-cut face. The 53-year-old doctor went over Malice's medical chart while she was rushed on the gurney to the elevator. She had a low heart rate and could barely breathe on her own. Bullum would have brushed off the symptoms since Malice was sedated, but her skin color and eyes proved that she was sick. She was pale and black rings were around her eyelids. Thirty minutes ago when Bullum had last seen her, the woman appeared healthy, even the last tests showed that everything was stable. So how could this have happened? Bullum quizzed himself. He stared at her face that was half covered with an oxygen mask. When he first saw her several weeks ago, he was amazed at the beauty. She was born in the 12th century in what would become modern-day Turkey. If she was not a high-profile criminal then historians would be lining up to get her eyewitness accounts of life all those centuries ago, thought Bullum. He was also flabbergasted by the technique used by whoever had preserved her in a sleep state for all those centuries. The process had kept her cells fresh so that she awakened resembling a mid-twenties woman. Suddenly Bullum had a brainstorm. Could her cells be now collapsing due to being out of the preservation chamber? He clung to the assumption and started performing tests to prove the theory right. An hour later in the medical room and he still had no conclusive results. Furthermore Malice's condition had worsened. Augustus called again for an update and agitation was growing in his voice each time. Meanwhile as Malice's life slowly ebbed away, she dreamt of her late husband King Midas. Their first meeting was frightening and fascinating for her. She didn't know the reason she was let out of the sleeping chamber and who was her new master. She was led to a man wearing a metallic suit. The sight astounded her just like the jeep she had been driven in. She stared into Midas's green eyes. Was he going to hurt her? He approached and she realized that she had no free will to use her powers against him. She was under his spell. He placed his right hand on her forehead like an anointing. 
the touch was surprisingly warm. Then a bright white light bombarded her mind and she couldn't think straight. Afterwards the light subsided and he asked her name. She understood his language and she answered fluently in his tongue. From there on she went to work killing for him. Malice remembered that her attraction for him grew quickly and they became lovers. Eventually he proposed and freed her of the spell. The dream shifted to the last night she spent with her husband. They were on their honeymoon and waiting for the duel with Tichala and Ororo. During those precious and tender hours before the showdown she had experienced a tranquility she had never known. It shocked her. She was now a queen after years of being an orphan thief and a slave. The country that she shared with Midas was one of the wealthiest in the world. And she was in the care of a handsome man who truly loved her. It was more than she ever expected to get out of life. The dream lingered at that point, and then death's drowsy whisper came to her. Chapter Augustus was scared that Malice's death would delay his plans. Do everything possible to revive her, he said to Balam over the phone. Balam nodded. Okay, okay. Then he heard the click as Augustus hanged up on him. He wiped a film of sweat from his forehead and exhaled deeply. Then he shoved his hands into the deep lab coat pockets. He had an idea. Why he did not think of it sooner. He placed it down to his ego that he could have handled the situation by himself. But he required help and from someone who was not even officially authorized to be working at the Central Medical Laboratory. In haste, he went to the basement labs. They were like a labyrinth. There were five doctors working on that level and none of them saw or heard each other. They operated out of specialist rooms that led directly to the underground car park. These speciality rooms were assigned to top secret research for Dell Plus, the state owned pharmaceutical industry giant. Balam often remarked that the lower levels reminded him of dungeons. As he walked down the wide corridor, his thoughts fell on prison and that he might end up in one if the scheme was ever made public. He made his way to a silver door and entered his keycard into the security lock. The door shifted sideways while a soft alarm beeped. Hurriedly Balam entered the lab and he saw the person he came for. She was in a green lab coat. Her hair was in a ponytail. Balam still found that her profile was attractive after the 13 years since he had last seen her. Looking back through time, he saw himself at university summoning the courage to ask her out on a date, but her egoistic and rather obnoxious behavior changed his mind. In the end, he went on a date with someone else and years later he had married her and had two beautiful daughters. Daughters he might never see grow up if Nokia Exxon did not fix the problem with Malice. He wondered if Exxon had children even though she didn't seem like the motherly type. She looked at him like he was an intruder into her home. At the time she waited for the Valric machine to stop its revolutions. It was a circular device that held seven canisters inside of it. What is it? She asked with a West African accent. I have a patient. She's dying and I don't know the cause. Can you check her? The Valric machine word to a stop. Where is she? Upstairs. All right. But put on your scrub cap and mask, said Bullum cautiously. He also had to keep Exxon's identity a secret. He was doing her a favor by allowing her to work in the labs. She had shown up several days before looking for freelance work. He obliged since Augustus demanded that the process using Malice's X gene be sped up. Hence Exxon was unknowingly assisting him in the scheme. As usual Balam found that the trip back to the higher levels was faster than the one coming down. Soon they arrived at Malice's medical room. Balam cleared out all the other personnel and he switched off the audio-video recorders. All right work your magic, he said. Exxon ignored his foolish statement because her ability was not magic, rather it was from her mutant genes. She walked slowly around Malice, gazing down at the woman. 
never would have Exxon expected that she was connected with the fellow mutant. An extremely powerful one, thought Malice. Abruptly Exxon finished her molecular examination of the woman. What's the diagnosis? asked Balam. Exxon looked at him suspiciously. Has she been experimented on? Balam pursed his lips. He should have expected that she would have noticed. Kind of, he admitted. Exxon noticed much more. For instance that the genes she worked on in the basement came from malice. Well it has caused slow and massive cellular degradation in her body. Can anything be done? I can create a gene therapy to hold the process for now. But it might be too far gone to help her permanently. You can work on it downstairs, said Bullum relieved somewhat. May I ask who she is? It's best you don't know. With that Exxon returned to the dungeon labs and Bullum contacted Augustus about the new development. Chapter Nightfall did not come quickly enough for Augustus. He desperately craved for sleep after the long day. Tomorrow he entertained Tichala and Ororo. They would ask for malice and he would carry them to the laboratory. They'll see that everything was under control and therefore drop off the nanny ties that kept malice's mutant abilities neutralized. Then they'll depart. It's like a game of chess, said Augustus as he observed an expensive chessboard in his study. The gold and crystal pieces were laid out, awaiting a game. There was a knock at the door. He went and checked. It was an aide informing him that his wife had arrived at the house. Then Augustus returned to the quietness of his study. He thought about his wife and the hell he must be putting her through with his secrets. Yet it was for her own benefit that she knew nothing. He took a glass and poured some scotch and then threw in some ice. In his mind he saw the chess pieces that he was moving in the dangerous game that he played. Chapter The Wakanda Jet's engines sang like a banshee. As the plane skimmed the top of white clouds that obscured the Taspian Sea. On the inside, T'Challa and Aurora found themselves in what was becoming a bad habit making love on the plane. Yet one could excuse the couple on the grounds that the extremely dangerous and uncertain lives they lived compelled them to snatch every available moment to express their love. Apart from attraction and affection their marriage was set on mutual respect and trust. T'Challa never considered his wife a trophy. He never took for granted that in his arms was a woman who was a mutant, a teacher, a goddess, a mutant leader, a stateswoman, and a fighter. Likewise Aurora didn't forget that man loving her was a champion of earth, a statesman a foremost and fearsome warrior, teacher, and that his keen mind worked towards mankind's benefit. Yet he possessed other skills that thrilled her in their lovemaking and intensified her pleasure. Meanwhile the sleek jet automatically turned southward and cruised gently into the main flight lanes towards Dayton. Another hour passed, then eventually T'Challa and Aurora released each other and they took a shower. Aurora emerged first and she promptly dressed in her black and gold uniform. The last item she slipped on was her deceased mother's amulet. The manner in which her Kenyan mother and African-American father died was a subject that she was slightly touché on. Because she had remained with the dead bodies under the rubble of their home that was destroyed by an air attack in Cairo. The experience had scarred her mentally and manifested itself in claustrophobia whenever she was in tightly enclosed places. Her experiences as an orphan in Cairo also left her with a great deal of street sense. As well as pickpocketing skills. T'Challa exited the shower just as his wife levitated herself with air currents. She stood erect like a pin. A curtain of natural white hair draped the sides of her face. Then she proceeded out of the bed quarters and into the corridor that ended at the flight controls. Perfect, thought T'Challa. He went over to his Kamoyo supercomputer. He had a clean-cut face, a healthy and athletic 35-year-old body. He was in the midst of planning another surprise romantic getaway with Aurora. On this occasion he had something spectacular in mind and dear to Aurora. 
The only problem was that it was difficult getting in touch with the queen ruler of another dimension. A woman who considered Aurora her daughter and whose storm was fond of. T'Challa's friend Reed Richards had located the dimension. And T'Challa had an idea in regards of sending a message to the queen. He would do it through his sword's time and space computers. The first attempt hadn't worked so this was his second try. The sword was leaned against the left wall. T'Challa's hyper sense of hearing and scent kept vigil for Ororo as he awakened the computers. What is it? The twin gold seals on the hilt asked. We're sending the message again, said T'Challa. Meanwhile Ororo picked up on the subtle geomagnetic pulses within the plane much like a wolf would sense its prey in the wind. It was innate to her. The pulses lasted for a few seconds and disappeared. She glanced at the empty corridor from her chair. He's doing something, she muttered with half a grin. Then her blue eyes fell on the silver case in the corner. It contained the nanny ties for malice. But Aurora didn't want to think about the woman. Instead she concentrated on T'Challa. He was a weapon. Bred to be the sword, shield, and leader of his nation. He had to be sharper, more intelligent, and stronger than his enemies were. Those standards led to his high tolerance to pain, deadly combat skills and an engineering mind. Yet his strengths were also his weaknesses. At times he overextended himself. It had even caused a health scare a few years ago when it was discovered a brain anomaly might kill him. Thankfully that has seemingly disappeared, thought Aurora. She heard him walking along the corridor and soon he was in her sights. He was six feet tall and broad-shouldered. He wore the Black Panther Vibranium Weave body armor. He clutched the sword in his right hand. The scabbard was made from nanorobots and they covered the large dark force energy blade. Chapter Aurora brought up the hologram image of the prison Malice was kept in. The running images showed the day before Malice's transport helicopter returning for her mere minutes after it had left the prison. I still don't quite get Augustus's explanation of him moving Malice so frequently. Why can't the prison medical bay handle her instead of the laboratory? Aurora pondered. On the other hand, she was glad for the opportunity to speak in person with Augustus over his superhuman disarmament plan. The salient aspect was the proposed deactivation of all X genes as a safeguard to people in developing countries from being experimented on by those involved in the arms race. While Aurora saw the merit, still she couldn't agree with it when there were alternative courses of action available before such a drastic one could even be explored. T'Challa shared her sentiments since the Global One initiative also targeted metahumans, superhumans who were not born with their preternatural abilities. He had a list of counter-arguments to go through with Augustus. He most likely will say that we are trying to protect our own, remarked Aurora. In a way he's right and we're right at the same time, highlighted T'Challa as he scanned the plane's computer controls. Still he is not addressing the root cause of this issue, which is world instability, stated Aurora. He should turn his focus to fostering world peace and that will end nations needing arsenals of that sort. You're right. Aurora peered out at the azure sky. To her it looked great enough to just float and relax in as she normally did on mornings. The autopilot lowered the plane's altitude and headed beneath the clouds. Below was the Roma mountain range that bordered Dayton. A Twitter of radio communications came on the flight control panel. T'Challa answered and the flight controller provided the CO ordinates to the aerodrome. Soon the plane careened over acres of farm lands. Manicured lots formed a jigsaw puzzle in the landscape. Rolling out of the rural community were towns and a highway. Aurora spotted the first city. There were three in Dayton. The designated airfield was near the second city. That journey took another ten minutes. Then T'Challa took control of the plane, he activated the vertical landing protocol. 
Thus thrust exited from the underside of the jet as it slowly descended on the specified location. Aurora got the silver case and she went by the door. The plane touched down gently and she opened the door. A stairs automatically unfolded from the door area. She surveyed the greeting party. It consisted of the lantern jawed Augustus, his wife, and a few aides. A limousine was parked behind them as well as the standard security. The surrounding area was cordoned off. Aurora stepped off the plane followed by Tichella. This was to be a low-keyed visit to Dayton. The objective was to check on Malice and the level of security around her. There would also be time to talk about the disarmament issue and address the media. Chapter The Premier's wife was quite courteous and pleasing. She was like a tourism minister highlighting the sights of Dayton to first-time travelers to the country. Tichella and Aurora held on to her every word. They sat opposite to Augustus and his wife in the back of the limousine. The vehicle was heading for the Central Medical Laboratory. Augustus had immediately broken the news of Malice's illness when he met Tichella and Aurora at the airport. He stated that the head of the International Criminal Court was informed of the matter. As expected the couple wanted to see Malice's condition firsthand. That's when Augustus's wife started her conversation on Dayton culture and history. Inadvertently she wanted to know about Wakanda's customs and lifestyle. The couple obliged. Occasionally Augustus also gave a cordial input into the discourse. He knew that Tichella and Aurora were examining him. Seizing him up for when they would discuss more weighty issues. Augustus was not a drab politician. He was a former Olympic swimmer for his country as a teenager and had a swim every morning so his body was in a healthy condition. He was a successful lawyer for 15 years, handling many high-profile cases. Therefore he had his analytical mind constantly working. How will my scheme penetrate Wakanda? Augustus wondered. They are in need of nothing from the outside world. Nonetheless tackling nations like Wakanda was the second stage of the plan. His henchman Victor saw about that aspect and had recently returned to Dayton. Stage one of the scheme was 24 hours away from going into effect. The limousine and security entourage meandered through the tree-lined city outskirts until they arrived at the Central Medical Laboratory. Dr. Bullum was on site to greet the party. He is the chief geneticist, said Augustus proudly. Bullum gave strong handshakes to his guests and showed them into the facility. Within minutes they were observing through a plexiglass window a sleeping and stable malice. The medical room she resided in was sparse and had a standard illumination. Bullum eloquently stated that Malice had a negative reaction from staying out her preservation chamber and that he had created a gene therapy to quell the effect in the interim. However the damage was irreversible and eventually Malice would die. When he finished, the doctor felt sick in his stomach. He was disgusted with himself. How can I look my children and wife in the eye again? He thought. What irked him even more was the ease at which he lied. Ever since he had crossed that first ethical line in medicine, dispensing falsehoods had become second nature to him. He glanced at Augustus, but the Premier kept his eyes set dead ahead like a sea captain navigating his ship through a storm with the harbour in sight. Aurora went closer to the plexiglass. Days ago, she had pondered on killing Malice if they fought again. Her reasoning was that the witch was too dangerous. She remembered that she had to make the same decision in an encounter with the mutant called Magneto. She had balked at her chance to end his life in cold blood. Now it appears I don't have to make that decision again, said Aurora inwardly. Yet killing Malice in open combat was no simple task. Her mutant ability allowed her to transmutate herself or other living organisms with a mere thought. From what Aurora understood the young woman also liked hurting people with her powers. Tichala knew nothing about his wife's dark plans for malice. He stared at the frail body on the other side of the glass. 
she had shown no remorse in court for the lives she aided in taking. Tichala recollected that it was only months ago that Malice's husband had attempted a prison break and destroyed most of the ICC detention center. Hence the reason Malice was temporarily relocated to Dayton's chief prison while repairs were made to the ICC's. Can we take a closer look at her? asked Tichala. Not seeing any danger, Balam obliged. Chapter Nokia Exon, said Tichala coldly. He took another slight sniff of the air within the medical room. She was here. Where is she now? He turned sharply to Balam. The doctor was flabbergasted and he looked childishly at Augustus. Well answer the man. Who is this Nokia Exon person? Augustus scolded. Balam was reaping the rewards for not informing the Premier beforehand of Exxon's input. The doctor stammered for a second under the weight of the authoritative voice and his guilt. Then he regained his nerve. She's an assistant. She helped with the care of the patient. But she isn't here right now. She left for the day. Where to? interjected Aurora. Balam paused and appeared strained. But Augustus was not in the mood for such behavior. Well out with it, he said. She went home, responded Balam. Do you have the address? asked Aurora. Yes, replied Balam. I'll have to check my iPhone. If you would excuse me. Then he walked briskly out. Aurora followed him closely like a hawk. This is a bit of excitement, commented the Premier's wife. Tichala ignored it as he gathered his thoughts over the discovery. The real impact was that Malice had harmed Exxon's son. And the teenager was now in Tichala's and Aurora's care. Who is this Exxon lady? Augustus asked again. Tichala returned to reality. We found her working with a renowned terrorist, she escaped and we've been looking for her ever since. So how did she end up here? inquired Augustus's wife. Aurora and Balam returned to the room. She had overheard the Premier's wife question. Exxon's a personal friend of Balam, said Aurora. We have the address. She faced Augustus. We request that it's us. She pointed to Tichala, who bring her in. Augustus thrust his hands into the trouser pockets and pretended to mentally tally the ramifications of such an action. Of course, he then said. There was a flutter of activity next. Tichala called the jet via his kamoyo as he and Aurora headed outside. Augustus expressed concern about a jet that size flying without notification over civilian areas. It has invisibility camouflage, assured Tichala. In less than five minutes, the jet settled and hovered over the complex's courtyard like a giant black bird. Aurora mentally manipulated the air around Tichala and herself and they were lifted into the jet's door. Now to work, said Augustus to himself. His wife went to the limousine while he spoke with Balam personally inside the building. Balam explained that he brought Exxon into the scheme without authorization. Move out all the evidence we have on the compound immediately. We're speeding up the process, said Augustus. By the time they return there should be nothing to back up that woman's allegations. Do you hear me? Yes sir. Chapter Tichala dived out of the jet and descended over the forested ridge that was half a mile behind the central medical laboratory. He straightened his body at an angle as he fell towards the trees. His timing needed to be flawless to survive. Meanwhile the banshee after burners of the jet kicked in and then the jet disappeared from earshot. Claws, thought Tichala and the microbots in his mask obeyed the command and they activated the weapons in his gloves. Then he studied the forest below. The trees were tall yet they did not intertwine and form a canopy. There were winding tracks of spaces amongst some of them good for nature trails and camping grounds. Those were to be avoided. Tichala spun his body to the left to move to the trees that were slightly more bunched together. A sudden upwind caught him, 
but he steadied himself. Then he returned to the angled and straightened descent. Gravity tugged at him harder as he neared the tree lines. Then they swallowed him. He sighted a spot to insert his claws, which he did quickly. Immediately he became upright. The sharp claws sank into the aged tree trunk. Yet Tichala kept sliding downwards. His body running over twigs and weak branches. There was the sound of a thick fabric ripping. Soon the rate of descent decreased and gradually the Black Panther came to a halt several meters from the forest floor. Seconds later he had nimbly somersaulted on several tree limbs until he touched the ground. He stayed crouched like a panther for a moment, taking in the twittering of birds and scurrying of little animals. He retracted the claws, and then he shot up in a run towards the central medical laboratory. Aurora was right, he thought, it was too convenient. And what was Exxon working on while she was there? Hence the couple decided that Aurora would handle Exxon while he doubled back to the laboratories. The little he knew of Exxon stated that she was a genius in mutated enhancements. Suddenly a helicopter roared in the distance, breaking the otherwise calmness of the forest. The sound was not coming in Tichala's direction but heading away towards the laboratories. Nonetheless Tichala kept up his rapid pace, the world flashing past him. He moved like a man accustomed to the wild. He sidestepped the twigs that snapped and gave away locations. Soon enough he arrived at the top of a ridge and stared down at the central medical laboratories. Then he saw the helicopter as it landed in the courtyard. He spied Balam walking towards the aircraft and a man was stepping out to meet him. Tichala observed that the strange man wore a long trench coat it probably concealed a weapon. The man's gait was not expected by Tichala. For the man moved like a person with heightened senses. Tichala knew that from his own experiences. Another factor of the man was that his body was refined for combat. Tichala noticed the balance and poise in each step. Then there was the cold attitude the mark of someone who had killed before. The strange man casually looked to top of the ridge and seemingly directly at Tichala. He shouldn't be able to see me thought the Black Panther. He was shrouded in the foliage. Then the stranger looked away. Balam and the man spoke briefly and then headed for the elevator. Satisfied, Tichala made his move downward. His target was Balam. Victor was Augustus's wife half-brother. He was born into money thus he never saw the reason to work in any of the family's businesses as a manager. Instead he journeyed the world learning various forms of martial arts. And trained his body to its ultimate physical peak. Victor loved a challenge and he could keep his mouth shut on many things. Those attributes prompted Augustus to ask his brother-in-law to join the scheme several months ago. Victor relished the opportunity and the great danger involved in the plot. Augustus ordered him to central medical laboratories. He was there to keep an eye on Balam and ensure that the transfer process was completed. Chapter Meanwhile Aurora left the invisible Wakanda jet hovering one street away from Exxon's abode. The Wind Rider wasted no time with her assault on the house. She emitted an electronic magnetic pulse that shut down all electronic devices within the house. Aurora then used her knife on the second floor side window to open it. When it was done, she slipped inside quietly. She scanned the house for human bioelectricity. She found it fumbling in a room that was along a narrow corridor. Cautiously Aurora opened the room door and there was Nokia Exxon drawing the drapes on a window. The woman who had abandoned her child. The sudden sunlight revealed that Exxon was dressed in a yellow t-shirt and worn out jeans. Aurora waited for her to turn around. Damn power company, Exxon stated as she looked away from the window. She froze when she saw Aurora. The two women eyed each other like combatants. Memories of the standoff in the Gobi Desert returned. 
That enraged Exxon since she lost her business place in that encounter and it halted her lucrative career as an underworld provider of genetic manipulation to various secret services. Her eyes started slowly turning red. Aurora's eyes were glowing white. A sober expression held on her face. She was choosing her words carefully. But Exxon was the first to speak. You have some nerve, she said. She looked over Aurora's shoulder to see if her son was nearby like the last time. She recollected that he was blind, but possessed an extraordinary ability to kill living organisms with an invisible energy wave from his eyes. Aurora noticed. If you're looking for Umba, he isn't here. He's at home in Wakanda. Then he should stay there, snapped back Exxon. How can you say that, he's your child? He's Shadani's son not mine's, snarled Exxon. And who are you anyway? How did you even end up with the boy? I may despise Shadani for being a mutant killer and a nefarious warlord, but he was also my uncle and he entrusted Umba into my care. Exxon was shocked that a mutant as powerful as Aurora was related to Shadani. Umba deserves an explanation as to why his mother wants nothing to do with him, said Aurora. I don't care to share, said Exxon. Now either get out of my way or I'll move you. She raised her fists threateningly. There were over a hundred ways Aurora could have used her powers to make Exxon unconscious. Still she wasn't going to back out of a hand-to-hand -hand combat challenge. She let her body hang loose and waited for the first strike. Exxon didn't disappoint and she came strongly at Aurora. Rather smoothly, Aurora dodged the first fierce punch aimed at her left jaw. Her eyes saw that the second punch was heading for her stomach. That one Aurora blocked with the back of her right hand. With the gambit countered, Aurora was then on the offensive. She deftly leapt off her left instep while bending her right knee. Hitting Exxon in the stomach with the knee that was a like a battering ram. The woman doubled over and Aurora smacked her across the face with a left hook and then leveled her right hand like a spade and shot it into Exxon's throat. Exxon tumbled onto the floor and coughed. She was given no time to recuperate. Aurora slipped manacles from her belt and placed them on Exxon's hands and lower legs. Then the Wind Rider produced the Kamoyo and called Umba. The stocky 15-year-old answered. We got your mother. Do you want to speak with her? Umba gave a slight pause before he replied. Aurora understood that he was stunned by the news. Then Umba responded. Okay, said Aurora and she put away the kamoyo. Reaching down for the prisoner she said, on your feet. You're going to see your son even if you don't want to. Then the weather manipulator fired a lightning bolt at the window, destroying it. Afterwards tornado winds wrapped up Aurora and Exxon and they flew out. Aurora only wondered if T'Challa had any luck. Chapter Take Me to Del Plus, were the last words T'Challa heard from Balam as the doctor scampered into the helicopter, holding two incubator cases. The rotor blades then screamed to life and the aircraft slowly ascended. But there was nothing T'Challa could do to prevent it. He was tied up battling Victor. The adversary's weapons of choice were tonfas. They were shaped like police batons and had customized adamantium blades at the ends. The instruments suited Victor well in the fight. T'Challa again tried to pass Victor but was impeded by the man. Tired with the nuance, T'Challa drew his sword. The nanorobots retreated into the hilt. Then he charged into his opponent. Victor held up the left tonfa defensively and the sword sliced through it. Still T'Challa saw the flash of the right tonfa as it slashed his wrists. Cutting through the body armor and searing into his flesh. The wound weakened T'Challa's grip on the sword handle. The predatory Victor sensed it and exploited the opportunity. He swerved to his right and lashed his foot out at T'Challa's hands. The force knocked the sword from the Black Panther's grasps. It went clanging onto the concrete surface. 
yet like lightning T'Challa whipped his left leg into Victor's ribs. The big man was heaved to the side. Stop at once, shouted a security officer, his weapon leveled at the two combatants. His comrades were forming a ring around the scene. Victor ignored the order. He spun the tonfas smoothly in his hands and then held them out at T'Challa. They were spinning distractions that concealed his true motives. Bleeding from his wounds, T'Challa keyed up for the attack. The silver tonfas reflected the sunlight as they came closer. He surmised that one was for defense and the other for the fatal blow. T'Challa caught another movement. Victor's right leg shooting up. The toe of the steel-tipped boot directed at T'Challa's chin. His right arm intercepted the incoming attack, smothering it with a block. A sudden sharp pain came in his left shoulder. A tonfa was viciously stabbed into it. T'Challa held his breath and nerve. Then the steely fingers on T'Challa's right hand snaked to Victor's exposed throat. The fingers became claws themselves and they seized the hard lump that protruded the throat. T'Challa yanked back sharply with his prize in hand. He looked across at Victor's cold eyes. The life fading out of them. Nonetheless T'Challa shoved Victor away. The man's hand slipped off the tonfa that was buried in T'Challa's left shoulder. The rest of the body fell backwards. T'Challa removed the tonfa and held the wound. That's enough, shouted the security guard. Put your hands up. T'Challa scanned the ring of officers. They were all in generic blue uniforms and held firearms. This was madness, he thought. All he wanted was to speak with Balam, but Victor had interfered. But why was he protecting Balam? The doctor had escaped without even attempting to stop the fight or call security. Now he was heading to Del Plus. It proved that his and Aurora's suspicions were correct. He detached his Kamoyo from the belt and called her. The guards were yelling at him to stop. Aurora came on the line. Balam is in a helicopter going to Del Plus and he's carrying two incubation cases, T'Challa said and he gave her the aircraft's identification number. Aurora stated that she had Exxon in custody. I'll get Balam also, she said. All right. I'll meet you afterwards. Then he hung up. He stared at the guards. They were slowly approaching him. Sword, he said. Instantly the weapon teleported from the ground into his waiting hands. He whispered the CO ordinates of the forest behind the ridge and then he vanished. Chapter Balam felt sick again. He had witnessed the most violence in the last ten minutes than he had seen in his life. He considered calling Augustus but the pilot would overhear the conversation. The interior of the helicopter was that quiet. His head was throbbing with pain and guilt. What have I got into? He asked. It was those goddamn pictures of people mutilated through the arms race that Augustus had shown me. There were more photos of the countries ravaged by wars waged with superhuman weapons. You can make a big difference in stopping this from continuing, Augustus had told him. Balam stared at the incubator cases that had digital coded locks. Inside of them were the culmination of his and Exxon's work and the answer to the question how to eradicate present superhumans and mutants and prevent any more from emerging without anyone knowing. Balam then looked out the window. They were approaching Del Plus from the woodlands. Already he saw the multi-story factory. He massaged his temples and longed for an end to the day. Suddenly the pilot was cursing loudly. Balam felt a sink in his stomach as the helicopter dipped suddenly. The pilot furiously pulled at unresponsive switches. Eventually he exclaimed, Mayday, Mayday. Then he realized that the radio was dead. He cursed some more. We're going down, said Balam before the pilot stated the fact. The doctor held onto his seat and looked at the window. They were going to crash into the trees. 
suddenly the helicopter began spinning wildly as though it was inside of a tornado. The pilot kept on yelling, Mayday, Mayday. So this is how it ends, Balam thought. His eyes flickering about the spiraling metal coffin. Then the revolutions eased up. Yet the falling sensation persisted. Balam's heart leapt into his throat. Something moved outside the helicopter. He only saw a glimmer of it. He peered out the window sheepishly. He was astonished. The helicopter was gently landing in a clearing, but not on its own power. Suddenly the door next to him opened and standing outside was Aurora. Her eyes gleaming terrifyingly. It was too much for Balam to take. He promptly fainted. Chapter Aurora rested the incubator cases in two passenger seats. She glanced at Exon who was strapped in another chair and glaring at her. The unconscious Balam was restrained in the corner of the main cabin. Then Aurora contacted Tichella. At the time he was mending his wounds and using his Kamoyo to find information on Del Plus. He gathered that the company supplied medicine to almost every country in the world. When Aurora called he teleported onto the jet. Nice to meet you again, he said to Exxon. She didn't bother with him and kept a blank expression. Umba wants to speak her, said Aurora. Did you give him that name? Tichala asked, focusing on Exxon. No, muttered Exxon since she was also questioning why Shaitani had named their child that. She reflected unashamedly about her time with Shaitani. She had met him on her first foray into underworld genetics. She was a freelancer for a science team. Shaitani provided human test subjects for a fee. Her first impressions of him were poor. He was uncouth and foul-mouthed until he had noticed her. She saw that he liked her. She ignored him. Then he left. If she regarded him a pauper on that day then on his return he was practically a prince. Everything had totally changed about him. He was clean, smartly attired, respectable and wore cologne that she liked. Still she kept her distance. He knew that the attraction was mutual and persisted. Eventually they started a relationship. However, Exxon realized that they were total opposites and her ambitions far outweighed his. She wanted to leave, but the baby came. She had Umba and immediately gave him up to Shaitani. She left to start her own operations and never heard or saw from them again. A hot plasma beam from Aurora's first finger cut through the locks on the incubators. Then she opened them. Wisps of cold air leaked out. Ten canisters rested in the top and bottom. I also found this disc on Balam, said Aurora as she raised it from her belt. Then she inserted the disc into her Kamoyo and activated the hologram projector. Like ghosts several images appeared and floated in the cabin. They were diagrams of chemicals along with genetic symbols and numbers. Tichala turned to Exxon. What does it say? Lazily Exxon looked at the images and she understood them. It made her blood run cold. It's unbelievable, she revealed. Regrettably she saw her input into the chemical designs. It's partly a manipulation of the X-gene depowering serum and a new agent. In short it kills off junk DNA, the X gene and any other enhancements that were not originally in the DNA sequencing, said Exxon. What she didn't know was that the new agent was designed from Malice's DNA. Do you know Premier Augustus, inquired Aurora. No, replied Exxon. Aurora examined her eyes for treachery. There was none. So Aurora believed her. This is what he wanted, remarked Tichala as he gazed at the hologram. Total superhuman disarmament. But how would he have distributed it, quizzed Aurora. Tichala thought about Del Plus and the reason Balam was heading to the factory. Maybe they were going to pass it off as pharmaceuticals. Probably the chemicals are able to hide or disguise themselves so that they are undetectable. 
then they are put into the general population. It's possible, said Ororo. We need to have a talk with Augustus. Chapter Augustus didn't grieve much over the passing of his brother-in-law. He had ordered that the matters remain quiet for the while. Not even his wife knew. Furthermore he hadn't heard from Balaam. Thus he locked himself in the administration office and wanted no disturbances. Then he pondered his next moves like a chess grandmaster. Suddenly a bright gold light stained his eyes. He sat erect in his chair, shocked by what had just happened. The light went and his visitors were the Black Panther and Storm. They held the incubator cases. It occurred to Augustus that he was about to lose the game. We know everything, said Tichala as he raised the case slightly. As a former lawyer, Augustus was aware that he should keep his mouth shut. Thus he stared blankly at his accusers. We'll be giving the evidence to the International Criminal Court, said Ororo. Still there was no show of emotion or response from Augustus. His eyes were dead. You didn't have to do this, said Tichala, there were other means useless arms control. Augustus leaned forward and rested his forearms on the desk. His indignation was stirred not even his lawyer instincts could restrain it. Don't insult my intelligence. Talk shops gain nothing. It was the less fortunate that I was looking out for. Their misery is on your hands now. His intent was noble but the approach was wrong, thought Tichala. If it would ease your mind. We have someone with inside knowledge of the superhuman arms race. She'll help us shut it down. Afterwards Tichala and Ororo departed and left Augustus to his fate. Chapter 4 X in the moment of truth had arrived. The door slid opened and a slight reflection of Exxon entered the room. He was strapping for a teenager. A computerized visor covered his eyes. She guessed it aided him since he walked effortlessly to the table and he drew back the chair and sat. He reminded her of Tichella. He must have a great influence on the boy, she thought. Accidentally her manacles bounced on the metal table. Do you want them off? Umba asked politely. No. They're fine. Exxon lied. I just want to get this over with, she thought. Why did you leave me? Exxon felt a twitch in her heart. Still she toughened up and she said flatly, when you get older you're going to have to make priorities. You were not a priority for me. So you care nothing about me. Do you care anything about me? Of course I do. You're my mother. Well to me, you are a stranger, said Exxon coldly. You're going to be imprisoned for a long time. What will be your priorities then? asked Umba wittily. The sarcasm cut Exxon. She had to smile a little. She was being harsh to him, yet he remained kind. Umba leaned casually forward on the table. He was enjoying the experience of having a conversation with his mother. Frankly it was not going the way he envisioned it. She called him a stranger. So he had to prove that he wasn't. Without warning, he pushed back the chair and stood. Then he walked quickly around the table, the gulf between him and his mother. She looked at him puzzled. Then before she could protest, Umba threw warm his arms around her and held her tightly. He rested the side of his face on her shoulder. He was surprised how he felt relieved to hug her. Soon he heard the little sounds of sobbing. She was crying. I love you mother, Umba said. Until yesterday I had disliked you, but having this chance has changed my mind. I love you even if you don't feel the same way for me. Then he released her. She was still crying when Umba exited the room. Five minutes later Tichala and Ororo entered. Ororo undid the manacles and Exxon wiped her eyes. You got what you wanted, she said. Not exactly, said Tichella. 
there is the matter of the people you associated with in the underworld. We have to go after them and you have to get out of that business. In return we'll set you free, said Ororo. Exxon's heart still ached. She had never held Umba. When he did, it was disarming and all the motherly instincts flooded her. She listened to the offer and weighed up the pros and cons ok, she said. If you want to see Umba again Exxon interrupted Ororo. No, no, I need more time. Ororo reflected on her mother and whatever memories she had of the woman. To know that her mother's love was taken away in instant by an act of violence made her unable to relate to Exxon shunning her son.